right, so you should be familiar with this work, um, Yinka Shonabari. Um, again, this is part, I think, <laughs> I can't remember if this is seven or eight of our um, lectures in contemporary art. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things going on this in this sort of installation um, sculpture piece. Um, and obviously, um, hopefully it reminded you um, instantly of another earlier work that we looked at called The Swing by um, Fragnard, who was a French Rococo painter. Um, and so here we do have a very good example of an artist deliberately referencing uh, another work of art and sort of the implications involved in that. It is important to understand that Yinka Shinobari is um, uh, an artist of color, uh, and so there's obviously some interesting um, distinctions that he's making or commentary that he's making in, in, the, in the sense of recreating uh, a, a French, you know, European, you know, white, um, you know, painting, um, clearly. Um, so when we look at the image, we see, you know, this headless sort of mannequin, you know, um, grasping this coiled rope of a swing suspended mid-flight. Um, you know, this is a life-size female mannequin. It kicks its foot off, left foot off, um, or left shoe off her foot, projecting her slipper into the air where it, hovel where it hovers in the tangle of branches. Um, our gaze is directed from the arc of the foot towards the vibrant trim of her petticoat, gown, and coat. And we can see, again, when we look up close, um, this is going to be an important element of um, Shinobari's work, um, this print, um, which we might look at and automatically think is, is sort of African or some sort of native um, print, but in fact it's actually um, Dutch um, and European. So obviously this is a recreation of a Rococo painting, The Swing After Fragnoid. Um, it's a three-dimensional recreation of the Rococo painting after which it was titled, and it offers testimony to the opulence and um, sort of frivolous um, nature of pre-revolutionary France. Um, remember they painted lots of art, you know, they painted art revealing um, images of party scenes and, and lovers, you know, meeting in secret, and there was lots of pastels, um, and it was, it was considered kind of a very feminine, um, kind of frivolous type of art. <clears throat> um, painted in 16, um, 1767, we'll go to the actual painting, um, Jean-Henri Fragnard, The Swing, depicts a coquettish young girl swinging in a lush, fertile forest and, of course, playfully kicking off her shoe. A sculpture of a bashful cherub looks on, but he's not alone. The female figure is flanked by two male figures lurking in the shadows. One seems to push her swing from behind as the other mischievously glances up the layers of her dress to catch a glimpse of what is beneath. And that was another feature of Rococo, this sort of naughtiness, you know, this sort of innuendo of sex, um, but not blatant um, sexuality being expressed. So one of the themes that you should think about is this idea of living with history. Um, this is a quote by Shinobari, because um, he is from England. Living in England, um, with my colonial relationship to this country, one cannot escape all these Victorian things, because they are everywhere in architecture, culture, and attitude. So Shinobari's quotations of 18th and 19th century style and sensibility are visually captivating. At the same time, taboos such as the swing contain some dark overtones. To begin with, the beautiful young protagonist of Fragnar's painting has somehow become headless in Shinobari's version. This is likely a reference to the use of the guillotine during the reign of Terra in the 1790s when members of the French um, aristocracy aristocracy um, were publicly beheaded, um, drawing our attention to questions of excess class and morality that were raised by revolutionaries two centuries ago. Shinobari invites us to also consider the increasing disparity between economic classes today, especially alongside um, the growing culture of um, paranoia, terror, and xenophobia, and global politics um, since um, the event of 9-11 in New York City. 
As a British-born Nigerian raised between Lagos and London, Shinobori is especially um, perceptive in the ways in which issues of excess, nationalism, and belonging have their roots in modern European history, particularly with regards to the United Kingdoms and its relationship to its former colonies. So here we're getting into that territory, this colonization of, of you know, the New World. Um, and, you know, other sort of exotic areas and, you know, places in Africa and this idea of the exotic or the other. Um, here's where the specific fabric um, that Shinobari utilizes becomes more relevant um, as their symbolism is steeped in histories of cultural appropriation, imperialism, and power. So these are some other um, works done by Yinka Shunabari I thought you'd be interested in seeing. So um, though tailored in the fashion of 18th century French aristoc um, aristocratic style, the costumes that you see here um, that model um, Shunabari's um, protagonists um, have been sewn from colorful and abstractly patterned fabrics. Um, with quite different origins, the bright golds, reds, and blues arranged in geometric motifs across her ruffled skirt, we'll go back to the original, um, are typical of the African Dutch wax fabrics that Shinobari has famously used to adorn his um, figural um, um, images or sculptures throughout his career. So you can see definitely the, the sort of Victorian, or what we think of as Victorian, it's probably a little bit older, um, style of dress, but then, you know, these very bright sort of, pat, you know, patterned, um, you know, sort of indigenous um, looking fabrics or, you know, patterned fabrics. Here's a close up. So while these fabric, fabrics have come to signify African identity day, today, the patterns on Dutch wax fabrics were originally based on motifs found in Indonesian batiks and were manufactured in England and Holland in the late 19th century. Predictability, um, the European imitation did not prove um, lucrative when sold in South Asian markets, so Dutch manufacturers then marketed the textiles to their West African colonies, where they since have been appropriated and integrated into the local visual culture. So it actually might appear like an African motif, but in fact, it, it really comes from, from Asia and Indonesia. Um, the Dutch, you know, decided to sort of manufacture and sort of appropriate, the, appropriate those motifs weren't able to commercialize on it, and so in turn decided to um, sell the fabric to their West African colonies, which have appropriated the fabric and has have since sort of absorbed it as part of their identity. So when we look at these fabrics, we naturally associate them with this sort of African um, tribal culture. As such, um, Dutch wax fabrics, as we know them today, are the products of this complex economic and cultural entanglements that results um, from European imperialism. As, um, as one curator has noted, um, Shinobari uses the fabrics as a tool to investigate the place of ethnicity and the stereotype um, in modernist representation. So the textile is neither Dutch nor African, therefore the, uh, um, the itinerary of ideas um, it circulates are never quite stable in their authority or meaning. As fictional as their Africanness may appear to be, however, the fabrics have now been completely assimilated in places like Nigeria, where Shinobari grew up. Um, uh, as another curator points out, the, ma the material Material is both fake and authentic, both ready-made and original, not to mention indisput indisputably um, cosmopolitan. The question of what is often um, <laughs> authentically African um, has a personal resonance uh, for Shinobare, who, as an art student in London, was shocked when one of his instructors suggested that he make work that expressed his African identity. This, controvert, this um, conversation prompted him to think about stereotypes 
and the area that exists between categories of identity and culture. The artist began using the material in 1992. So getting back to the swing. So what might Shinobori wish to communicate by bringing together these African textiles with um, Fragnar's um, Rococo image or any other European masterpiece that the artist has appropriated in his sculptural installations? In imagining this particular moment in European history, Shinobari wishes to forge connections between imperialism, the aristocrats, um, arist <laughs> aristocrat um, society, and the colonized wealthy class. In the swing after Fragnoid, which is loaded with references to the French Revolution, the Age of Enlightenment, and colonial expansion into Africa, Shinabari asks us to consider how a simple act of leisure can be so controversial. While the leisure pursuit um, might look frivolous, and this is, this is a quote by him, my depiction of it is a way of engaging in that power. It is actually an expression of something much more profoundly serious insofar as the accumulation of wealth and power that is personified in leisure with no doubt a product of exploiting people. In this and other works, Shinobari chooses stories, including biographies, world events, and works of art, which are already effective allegories concerning race, class, and corruption and greed, calling our attention to some of the darker moments in Western history. However, his use of this Dutch wax fabric with its um, um, spurious orient origins um, is, uh, <laughs> and its misleading aesthetic identity serves as a reminder that history and truth are also themselves construction. So again, we, we do like, um, Kara Walker, we have, um, artists, um, who are dealing with this idea of history, um, you know, what is historical, you know, versions of history, rewriting history. Um, those are themes that you should consider, I think, when looking at their work. Right. Um, the next artist we're going to be looking at, at is L. Antisui. Um, this is called Old Man's Cloth. Um, again, he is another um, artist um, Afri of African descent. Um, and you can see this is much different than um, Shinobari's work. It's much more abstract. Um, it is an installation, sort of sculptural installation. Um, and his work is, is extremely um quite provocative and, and just wonderful to look at in person. And again, it has issues associated with how we um, reinterpret history or how we look back, um, how we, you know, interpret, um, you know, negative things in our history and culture, in particular slavery. Um, so old man's cloth hangs like a large tapestry. But when we look closer, it's easy to become captivated by the small fragments that comprise the work in hundreds, um, arranged with shifting grids of stripes and blocks of color. The components from their own internal maps across the surface, melding into vertical gold bands, interlocking black and silver rows, um, or a deviant red piece floating in a field of black. So here's an example of sort of um, how these images are or, you know, how um, his work is sort of comprised. So he's sort of, um, you know, attaching or, um, you know, hooking together um, these, these sort of fragments, which have um, a symbolic meaning and reference associated with them. Old Man's Claws has, have, have been constructed from flattened liquor bottle labels that the artist collects near his home in South Nigeria. While critics often write about Antisui's um, metal wall hangings using the language of textiles, the labels and bottle caps are typically fastened together with copper wire and attached corner to corner. As such, the issue of medium is one of the first to inspire debate among viewers. So again, it's sort of hard to, you know, to put a category in terms of what to call it. Is it, is it sculpture? Is it installation? Um, is it a textile? Um, so are the wall hangings two-dimensional? Are they three-dimensional? Are they sculptures even as they hang against the wall like paintings? Um, are they individual works or immersive installations? Lastly, are they fine art or simply an innovative form of craft? 
purposely disregarding the limited categories imposed by Western art history, um, Antisui practices um, practice emerges from a more expanded understanding of what art can be. Um, that stems from both the radical practices of the late 1960s and from a vantage point outside of that Western tradition completely. As scholar Susan Vogel has explained, such categories did not exist in classic African traditions, which made no distinction between art and craft, high art and low art. You know, that, that purely is more of a Western um, concept. Um, Antisui's choice of discarded liquor bottles um, liquor bottle caps as a medium um, has much to do with their formal properties as with their historical associations. As an African artist whose career was forged during the utopia of mid-century African independence movements, his work has always engaged his region, region's history and culture. The bottle caps for Anasui signify a fraught history of trade between Africa and Europe. As he explained, alcohol was one of the commodities brought with Europeans to exchange for goods in Africa. Eventually, alcohol became one of the items used in the transatlantic um, slave trade. They made rum in the West Indies, took it to Liverpool, and then made its way, and then it made its way back to Africa. I thought that the bottle caps had a strong reference to the history of Africa. The luminescent gold colors also recall the colonial past of Antisui's home country. Modern Ghana um, was previously a British colony called the Gold Coast until its independence in 1957. The fluid movement of the work surface reminds us that Western, the waters of the Atlantic Ocean, which carried slave ships and traders between Africa and Europe and the New World, so again, it's sort of connecting these different trade la um, trade routes, you know, with different commodities here, trading alcohol, trading slaves, so forth. By bestowing his work with such titles as man's cloth and woman's cloth, Anasui also makes references to the significance of text textiles in African societies and in their own historical role in trade networks. So again, this is similar to, to some of the elements um, to Yinka Shinobori's use of the Dutch wax fabric. Old Man's Cloth was included in one of Antisui's first exhibitions of hanging metal sculptures held at London's October Gallery in 2004. The show was entitled um, Gawa, Gawu, which means metal cloak in, um, in Ui, um, which is, I guess, the language. Um, old man's cloth is unique for its uneven and jagged edges, as well as the rough texture of the recycled labels that are incorporated into the piece. Um, El Antisui was born in Ghana in 1944 and was trained as an academic European in an academic European curriculum. In 1964, when he began his studies, many parts of Africa were experiencing a cultural renaissance associated with decolonization movements. Um, Antisui himself joined the unofficial um, Sankofa, S-A-N-K-O-F-A movement, which was invested in unearthing and reclaiming Africa's rich indigenous traditions and assimilating these with the European influenced aspects of society. His earlier works, for example, included a series of wooden um, market trays to which he burned designs inspired by African graphic systems um, and, and dingra motifs, um, symbols widely used by the Akan people of Guana. In 1975, Antisui joined the faculty at the University of Nigeria, um, Nusaka, I'm probably saying that wrong, N-S-U-K-K-A is a city, was a vibrant creative capital for African artists and writers in the 1970s, many of whom um, superheaded um, um, the Zaria Re Rebellion in the early 1960s and revived the traditional art form of uli wall and body painting in their contemporary works. And Asui's work different, differed slightly from that of his colleagues and his insistence on abstraction. And some of his first mature works, he uses an electric chainsaw to slash geometric patterns into wood. Though abstract, these works were metaphorically rich. And Asui chose wood of different colors to represent the diversity of African culture. 
um, while the violence of the chainsaw enacted the ruptures imposed by European imperialist expansion. So this is a, these are some images um, taken at the Brooklyn Museum of Art in New York City. I had, I had the opportunity to go to this exhibition. These are not my images, but um, this is, this is very, very, it, it gives you a sense of the scale of the work and it was, it was just amazing. But again, I, you know, when we look at art and on slides or in PowerPoints, you really don't get the sense. So I hope after taking this class that when you do go to a museum, you really will understand the experience of what it is to, you know, to look at art and to experience art. Um, and hopefully this class will give you a better appreciation for that. But this exhibition was um, phenomenal. Um, when two of Anna Sui's metal wall hangings appeared in the 2007 Venice Biennial, they were um, lauded by the public and swiftly, um, and it swiftly cemented his um, place as a leading international contemporary artist. So everybody loved it. Um, he had, in fact, already shown in Venice almost two decades earlier in 1990 when he participated in a small exhibition surveying contemporary African art. During the time that lapsed between the two exhibitions, the art world became more receptive to artists outside of its Western centers, and by 2007, Anasui could exhibit not only as a representative of the continent, but as an individual artist whose work was significant in its own right. As such, his work provides an excellent opportunity for discussion about the relationships between artists um, at the center, um, artists at the center and at the per, um, periphery or the outside, um, and between the West and the Global South. Um, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, for instance, has now acquired two of Anasui's metal wall hangings, but they are owned by two different curatorial departments, the Art of Africa, the Arts of Africa, Oceania, and America, and Modern and Contemporary Art. Both were recently on view at the same time, but in separate galleries. Um, visitors, students, and art historians should continue to ask themselves which designations seem more appropriate and for what reason. Should we understand art as a product of its place? It's time or both. What do we see in Anasui's work when it is placed among African masks and ritual objects? And how do our impressions change when that work is placed beside contemporary art from around the world? So that's a really interesting um, question. There are no correct answers to this question, but they are indicative of the change that has taken place both in the art world and today's increasingly connected society at large.